this thing 700 plus pounds on a single charge. and lead vehicles had to pull over to get gas and you just cruised on past with 81% state of charge. So good job, that's pretty cool. 71% SOC, we'll be at the bridge in about half an hour. We're gonna have to go to the Upper Peninsula and burn some more energy off. All right, uh, let's get started. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening from wherever part of the world you're joining us. Uh, we announced this um, Chai and Cup Sub session over now almost two weeks ago. And since then we have been inundated uh, by requests uh, from all over the world as far as South Africa and Australia, people reaching out to me and asking how it can be joined. Of course, we have two uh, rock star founders, um, celebrities in their own worlds um, in part of our gap shop today. Um, one of them uh, happens, one of them, both of them have built companies. One of them after having built companies that either went through mergers or IPOs, uh, decided to walk over to the other side and help builders. The other one has uh, created a company that is make, making waves uh, all over the world due to their big breakthrough products. Um, so before I introduced um, each one of them, a few housekeeping uh, uh, items. Uh, this is a, a Zoom webinar, which basically means that uh, if you need to ask a question, please feel free to raise your hand. I will promote you to a panelist and then you can ask your question live. Uh, to either Faisal or uh, Majid, or you can just type in your questions in the Q&A window um, and Faisal or myself, either one of us will read and we'll be able to ask Majid. Uh, this is session is being recorded and it's live on Facebook and we'll have a recording afterwards on our YouTube channel as well. So our first guest is a renowned venture capitalist, Faisal Sohail. Uh, Faisal is a builder who built some amazing companies and then decided to help other builders. Um, Faisal likes to work with brilliant people who solve big problems. Um, Faisal is the managing director of Presidio Partners and has over 20 years of experience uh, as an entrepreneur and as a venture capitalist. Um, our second guest is uh, Mujib Ejaz, founder and chief executive of Our Next Energy. Mujib is an engineer with over 30 years of experience in development of electric vehicles vehicle systems and technologies. And his career has focused on furthering the adoption of electric vehicles through advancements in battery, safety, range, and cost. 
I won't steal Faisal's uh, introduction uh, about Majib, uh, but um, um, Mujib, uh, his, uh, if, if I might want to summarize, uh, I've, I'm, I'm currently um, in, in LA. I had to drive yesterday from San Francisco to LA. And as I was pulling my Tesla out of the garage, I was thinking about, I looked at the range and I was thinking about Mujib and I was like, Mujib, can you please expedite what you are doing so that <laughs> I won't have to worry about next time uh, thinking about where the chargers are going to be and, uh, you know, where I'll have to park, how the weather is and everything. So I will let Faisal and Mujib, uh, you know, figure it out. But Mujib, we, we just can't wait uh, for the technology to get to our hands um, as soon as possible. So thank you for being our guest today. And Faisal, with that, I'm going to transfer over to, I was trying to think of a, like a really, really big intro, uh, but I couldn't, but I, I'm just going to play this something really quick and see if that works out. So that's a big applause. If you were in person, probably would have done that in person. As well. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you, Farhan, so much for uh, the introductions. And it's just absolutely my pleasure to have uh, uh, Majib Ijaz, the CEO, founder of uh, One here this morning, uh, to talk about some world changing technologies. I'm just a small part of uh, being uh, with Majib to help him, you know, think through his uh, wonderful journey that he's been on. I've had the privilege of being uh, there from day one, but this is really Majib's show. And I really want you guys to uh, ask him tough questions and, and talk about how he's changing the world. So, so, you know, as Rahan said, for me, it's all about, you know, two critical things, which is large growing underserved markets, and world-class entrepreneurs. And Majib, I see both. And Majib and one, uh, I saw both. He is obviously world-class and you'll, you'll hear from that and you'll see not just his experience, <clears throat> his passion in, in terms of his background all the way from Ford to designing these cars before we even thought about them to A123, uh, you know, building the first US real battery company uh, with a lot of different platforms to Apple, secret projects where we won't talk too much about to now starting one in the middle of COVID, um, you know, and so he's obviously a world-class entrepreneur, but most importantly, then he married that to a very large underserved and a very fast growing market. And when those two things come together, you know, you have fireworks and you have amazing uh, potential. So that's, uh, that's who Majib is. And uh, quick background on me, uh, Silicon Valley, 37 years now, uh, been an entrepreneur, started a lot of companies in deep semiconductor technology and the last 20 years venture capital. And, and I funded, I think, four battery companies. This is the most exciting, the, uh, the latest one, and obviously growing really well. So that's the that's sort of the backdrop. And Majib, I want you to say a couple of things about your personal background, and then I'll get into asking you some tough questions. Very good. Well, it's first of all very nice to be invited to join this forum. And uh, Farhan and Basil, I appreciate the introductory remarks. I want to say right off the bat that being an entrepreneur um, means that you have to make a decision at some point in your um, journey as your professional development goes through companies and different experiences, you have to make the decision to um, build something uh, from, from scratch. And that's not an easy decision. Typically, when you make a hard decision, you surround yourself with people you trust that help you think through, are all the ingredients right to make that big life-changing decision because it affects your, your family, your future um, livelihood, and also it puts um, the most precious asset we all have, which is our time, it puts a lock on your time to where you're now going to invest a massive amount of personal energy to try to create something. And you know, as I have reflected in my life, I always look back at people that have uh, been able to guide and help and give me mentoring. And Fassel has been a wonderful, inspiring, mentoring type of leader. Um, it's rare to meet someone very successful but then also very humble. Those are excellent qualities where you can be successful, but then you can share that experience set and you can help other entrepreneurs be confident. 
because actually getting that confidence is not easy. It's really maybe one of the key ingredients to being a successful entrepreneur is meeting the mentors around you that will help you think through your ideas and then believe in you enough to give you the motivation to get on the journey and to not be um, you know, deterred from any of the obstacles because there are plenty of obstacles. Um, my personal background, I was born in Virginia. My parents were both uh, in alternative energy. My father was a nuclear physicist teaching at Virginia Tech. My mother um, got her PhD at Virginia Tech and started to work on solar cell manufacturing in the early 70s. And so our din dinner table conversation, you can imagine, centered a lot around um, thinking through alternative energies and the nature of energy and how fossil fuels are a finite, limited resource, but electrification could bring about a long-term sustainable future. Because if you can make electricity 10 different ways, then you have a lot more stability in the foundation of that as an energy source. So I got interested in that, but it wasn't until I was at Virginia Tech and General Motors initiated the GM Sun Race, the first time they were calling college students together to create an electric vehicle platform from scratch and figure out how to race that you know solar car from Florida to Michigan that I got interested because I was interested in cars growing up. I was in mechanical engineering and that kind of married my parents' background of alternative energy with my interest in autom automotive, with the technologies that could kind of transform energy. And that was a true gift. That spark lasted um, about two years. We worked on developing um, this uh, solar vehicle. And in those two years, I picked up the systems engineering kind of like grassroots. You know, you learn from professors, you learn from mentors in industry. And, and that idea of hands-on in universities is one of the most important assets that young entrepreneurs can think about and college students can think about is get your hands on, then you'll ask the tough questions, then you'll find the people that can help you answer those questions, then you'll build relationships and relationships propel you in your career in a way that you can't predict. And those early relationships eventually helped guide me to work at Ford Motor Company where I worked on battery technologies and then eventually uh, helping to build the automotive side of a lithium ion battery called a uh, technology company called A123 in Michigan. That was my kind of like my training ground as an entrepreneur. I was in still a big company, but I was the first employee in Michigan. And therefore I had the opportunity to go through a practice of building something without it being completely on my shoulders with respect to fundraising and kind of standing the company up from scratch. That was a very helpful experience, including the lithium ion battery um, effort itself. And as I uh, was working at Apple after working at A123 for six years and then joining Apple, I started thinking about 30 years electrification looks like it's starting to pick a channel where it can really take off. What are the actual problems that are being uh, faced right now to bring that technology into the market successfully? And it, it kind of distilled itself down to three exact problems that were worth solving. And one thing I learned very clearly at uh, my time in Silicon Valley is pick, pick a, a, if you want to create the disruption, pick a problem to solve that will enable it. And then even if you have no idea how to get there, that becomes your guiding uh, star for how you set the technology in motion in the company and developing. And then you'll own the IP, you'll own you know the path to that solution that no one else is thinking about. You will have a very unique position by enabling the roadmap to something that people don't even think is possible. And I like that kind of challenge because actually if you want to create a disruption, it usually is that you have to invent technologies that were previously thought of as impossible. So we set three goals. The first was double the range of today's electric vehicles. The second, do it without nickel and cobalt due to safety and mining and supply chain risks, and then develop um, a more clear path for localization of material mining to the markets that the electric vehicles were in. For example, North America, South America, Europe, Sub-Sahara, Africa, Asia, we want mining and material supply to not be constrained by geographic lock so that we end up with the same problem we have with oil deposits being a country of haves and then a bunch of countries of have nots. And then people fight over the energy supply because it's now locked in a material. So we eliminated nickel cobalt from our choice of materials for battery technology, which was um, a little difficult because that was as far as today is concerned 
the leading materials that create range are nickel cobalt based. But in doing that, we liberated ourselves also because now we had to start inventing something that hadn't been done before. And by, um, you know, by all accounts, it takes a bit of like incubation, pressure and um, persistence to find your journey to an idea that eventually can work. And so far we've created a couple of battery ideas that we think now we can bring to market very quickly. Uh, within four years, we believe that we can take a battery to production that will double the range of an electric vehicle. And I'll pause there though, I'll give Fassel the floor back. And that's kind of my introductory set of ideas on basically who, who am I? Uh, I'm married, I have three children. Uh, we're uh, all kind of engaged in the idea that this company is more than um, an opportunity to build a successful business that has clearly my life's work is around sustainability and bringing um, technologies to market that can electrify and create a transition. Uh, and I'm just super excited to have the opportunity to work with brilliant people like Fassel and others on my board. Um, we are blessed with a good board and uh, being able to grow the company with investment and also with stewardship of building the relationships we need to take the company forward. So back to you, Fassel. Uh, great. Thanks for that. Uh, thanks for that introduction. You covered a pretty wide space, so that makes my life uh, a lot easier. So let's talk about sort of the heart of the you know, the number one thing that you said, why did you pick doubling the range as the number one of the three things? I totally understand the material supply and, and getting rid of expensive materials, but why double the range? What does that do for you in terms of markets? Yeah. So if you if you think about the, the very consequential um, uh, decision that consumers need to make, for themselves is will the product meet all of their expectations and requirements to transition from a fossil fuel vehicle to an electric vehicle. And what we're in the middle of right now is the emerging market, but we are not very clearly at the actual market. And the emerging market means the consumers that are buying are willing to adopt for a lot of motivating reasons. They might have the money to spend on electric cars, which are much higher in price, they might be motivated by their own personal goals and sustainability and electrification. But the major market is still on the sidelines. And why is that market on the sidelines? It's, it comes down to a question, what range of an electric car can make the car your only car? Because actually, we don't all have the luxury to make an electric car your third or fourth car where you use it when you can kind of conveniently use it as a metro vehicle. But then you take a different vehicle on a long trip. Now, we did a study in, in the US, the um, single daily event that covers 85% of all vehicles in the United States is 285 miles. So that means that at once in a year, people are driving 285 miles. Well, you know, you've heard of electric cars being more than that, like 320 miles is now not a hard number to achieve for an electric car. And many are on the road that do that. The entire problem rests in the definition of that range is not actually the real world range. It is that two, 300 mile electric car that you're buying that's rated at 300. If I drive it at 85 miles per hour, which is a common speed now, you'll get around 180 miles. And that 180 miles will go down to about 150 miles when you're using the heating or climate in a severe condition in winter and summer, you're gonna get half the range. And if you're getting between 40% less or 50% less, the number, then the real world number just got a lot worse. And then you get into the complexity as Farhan mentioned, that you wanna drive a vehicle from city to city and you don't wanna deal with standing in line, waiting for a charger to open up or having to find that that is an inconvenience to stop you when you otherwise didn't wanna stop. So the adoption of an electric vehicle that can do 400 miles real world, which in my estimation is something in the neighborhood of 750 miles of rated range, that actually is a product that a vast majority, more than 90% of the market are willing to buy. And that's based on a University of San Diego study where 14,500 people actually did precisely answer the question of what is the barrier? And then what, when would we be willing to adopt an electric car? So we're following that data, that evidence and following the numbers and saying, okay, you actually need to take the rated range and double it to really give people 
400 miles real world so that they can kind of accomplish whatever they're doing. And now an electric car can be your only car, which takes, takes the adoption rate from maybe 10%, well past 50%, and then on its way to like Norway at 90%. We need to do something significant to create adoption. So, but, but your first demo vehicle even blew past the 400 mile real world range. You did 752 miles. I mean, that's pretty unheard of. And so, so that means, you know, in terms of technological breakthrough solution, can, you know, what can you share that's, you know, obviously public and not confidential from technology perspective uh, that allowed you to achieve that type of uh, breakthrough? Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. There's two uh, important nuggets in that question that I want to cover carefully because it's an important part of the explanation of what we're going after. When we drove that range run, we were trying to figure out how to make the run more understandable for everyone to like see where our technology is going. And if you take the Environmental Protection Agency cycle that every automaker is required to drive a vehicle on to rate the range and put that number on the window, the equivalent speed of that, if you just do an average single speed and you can get to the efficiency of the vehicle, it's about 55 miles per hour for a Tesla Model S. It changes whether it's a truck or an SUV or a car. But anyway, for that Tesla Model S, if you just drive steady state speed 55, you'll get around the EPA rated range. And that's why we did that test at 55 miles per hour. We wanted a comparative number for the window sticker, the rated range, the real world range, if I were to drive that vehicle at 85 miles an hour, would have turned into more like 400 miles. But that's okay, because actually that's the real world drive that people want. That's where we're headed. So that 750 is more like the equivalent rated range. And then the 400 comes driving it any way you want in the middle of winter, going up and down hills, not worrying about the noise factors of the real world. So that's one point. The second point is that when we think about the technology, how did we achieve that? And what are we working on in our labs to bring about this sort of revolutionary idea of doubling the range? The way that we're approaching a battery is we've realized that 99% of the daily drive is covered with a, um, 150 miles of range, that your metro area driving, your daily need, no one wants to spend you know seven hours a day in a car. So their commute and their moving around is covered under 150 miles. But 90% of the purchase decision to buy an electric car is above 150 miles. And if you get out to that 750 rated 400 real world, if you get to that number, then you'll get the entire market. You'll get more than 90% of the market. So what we decided is that we could divide the battery into two distinctly different segments. The first segment's a daily driver. It uses a conventional chemistry without nickel cobalt that has much higher safety, much lower cost, and that chemistry is called, called lithium iron phosphate or otherwise known as LFP. That battery is a conventional battery, runs the car on a daily basis. And it's about, think of that as a 40 kilowatt hour daily driver that we're putting into the battery pack. And then what we can do is we can add another 100 kilowatt hours in the remaining space that was otherwise there by using a very special chemistry that we've developed and that we're not gonna go into any details today on the call, but does not use nickel and cobalt, is much lower cost, and even uses 65% less graphite than the um, technologies that are in uh, the marketplace today. So in doing that special chemistry, we had to give up something because otherwise people will be doing this. What we realize is that because the, the extension of range, range extender does not need to operate every single day, just maybe once a month for that trip that Farhan just described, that type of uh, uh, equivalent duty cycle of once a month means that we don't need the same cycle life, the same durability. And that's where we're enabling now a library of technologies that never made it to automotive is we're putting one battery that's taking all the abuse of automotive with a normal chemistry, and we're pairing that with another battery that has an extraordinarily high energy density and low cost and great safety. We're pairing that battery to be the range extender. And as you call on it only once a month, for example, your lifetime can be 500,000 miles equivalent driving over a many year period. Um, we have the durability collectively between the two systems and that unlocked the ability for us to double the range by putting these two batteries together. 
Well, that's great. Thanks. Thanks so much. So let's talk about sort of if, if you're successful in this endeavor, which uh, inshallah you will be, and uh, you unlock the entire automotive market and not just automotive, but also delivery and, and some of the other longer range uh, markets. So from, you know, carbon footprint point of view, you know, the 51 billion that Bill Gates talks about uh, all the time, 50, you know, 50 billion tons of carbon that we have to remove a year. Um, how much of an impact does this make to, you know, the world that we live in? Um, yeah. You know, and, and how much of a problem are we solving from the environmental perspective as well? Yeah, it's a good, great question. And I've actually started the analysis to see kind of what is the percentage of that 51 billion that we can have an impact on. And as I describe the following, I want you to think about the idea of the virtuous cycle. The virtuous cycle is you do something that enables something that enables something else that keeps then um, promoting the first thing that you did. And it just keeps on that virtuous cycle. And an example of that is that as electric vehicle batteries can be produced with better materials, we are, we are currently finding a path to a net zero carbon electric vehicle battery. And that's a big deal. And right away from the material selection alone, we are around 80% less carbon dioxide emissions associated with the production of our battery versus the conventional nickel cobalt batteries that are being used by major automotive companies today. As we are looking for the last 20%, we're seeing strategies in the way the factory works, the way that we can co cooperate with the grid. We're, we're short, started, starting to work through how do we get to a net zero carbon dioxide footprint where an electric vehicle battery can be produced. Once the battery is produced, then it enables an electric car, which then takes off the table the fossil fuel burning. That's a good, very important transition is that we start reducing fossil fuel. But that also then promotes more people plugging their electric cars into their homes, which will start to connect the home and give home access to energy that was stored and derived from more renewable sources because the grid is going to ramp up more and more renewable sources because we're just reaching the tipping point where a renewable farm like solar farm is lower cost than installing fossil fuel plants. And as those virtuous cycles start to kind of increase, the more renewable you put on board, the more storage you need to capture renewable that we should be able to bootstrap into a new economy altogether that does not rely then on the foundational burning of fossil fuel to create the industrial momentum for countries to have like mobility and uh, workforce, um, energy and so forth, will derive that more often from renewable sources because you need effectively the batteries associated with them to store that energy. Oh, great, thanks Thanks for that uh, deep description and, and uh, uh, you know, educational piece of how we're all trying to solve this for the green economy. Uh, let's let's shift a little bit over from technology to financing and funding. And and you said you know you have you're blessed with a lot of a lot of really wonderful you know investors around you. Um, you know congratulations on a new round you just announced two days ago. Just perfect in time for this uh, little gup shop. Um, so you just raised another sixty five million uh, led by BMW. So. What can you tell us, you know, about sort of the financing strategy of the company? Where do you want to take it, you know, next and so on and so forth? Yeah, um, I think uh, maybe even a final thought on the last question to build a bridge to this question is when we uh, talk about our technology vision, we're really aggressively trying to accelerate the adoption of electric vehicles. And by enabling a range number that high, we we are not necessarily suggesting that every customer wants or needs that level of range, nor are we thinking that every automo automotive company would offer that amount of range. But what we're doing is we're changing the decision-making process in buying an electric car from being, do I want an electric car or not? Do which electric car range do I want to buy into? Because range is the new premium attribute for a vehicle. It's not leather, it's not the four cylinder, six cylinder, eight cylinder engine decision, it's range. When people buy electric cars, that's like very central to the exact bullseye of the customer concern of adoption. But when you give them offers 
of you can have 400 rated, 500 rated or 750 rated range, you know, small, medium, large or premium, that gives you the ability to access and grow the market faster than if you only give one option. And if people then say, I'm just not sure, it might've been good enough, but I'm just not sure. For that reason, one of the organizations that led our uh, Series A Breakthrough Energy Ventures, their approach to creating the sustainable future that was intended for the creation of Breakthrough Energy Ventures Fund by Bill Gates and other LPs that decided to come together on big ideas is they want to create the disruption of transition and reduction of uh, fossil fuel and greenhouse gas emissions, but they only invest in ideas that are um, large scale contributors. We had to meet a threshold requirement of how many uh, metric tons of CO2 we're going to reduce or what level of contribution are we in the 51 billion um, uh, total number. So as we're thinking about now, how we build the investor base, we decided to pair up with people that are uh, with funds that are like-minded, that are strategic, long-term, not financial investors. We don't actually have a single financial investor that's only uh, view of the world as financial gain through the company being valuable. We want companies and venture capitalists and uh, leaders in their organizations that have a long-term view of creating the transition. That then also guides us and it connects us with the right other partners. As you mentioned, BMW I Ventures um, is another investor. We've, we have some uh, uh, members that were former leaders at a national lab in the US that formed a fund. Now it's called uh, uh, Plus Volta Energy Technologies. Uh, that group cares a lot about sort of core technology and energy storage. And then we um, want to not lose sight of the industrialization aspect of our goal, which is supply chain development and manufacturing. So two of our partners that funded the company originally in the Series A are related to assembly uh, manufacturing and job creation. One's called Flex, they're a contract manufacturing company. The other one was Assembly Ventures. So those are our original five. We've just added CO2 as a large fund uh, global reach and that cares about scaling sustainability related technology companies to create factories, which is the stage that we're at right now. I would say that the biggest um, point of advice I would give anyone that's listening from an entrepreneurial perspective is plan out your investors carefully and make sure they're aligned and also helpful in networking the company to your goals. There'll be plenty of money to in the market, especially in this subject area, but you can't get the relationships and the, the vision and leadership without connecting to the right funds. It took us a little over nine months to assemble the Series A team. And that's um, actually, that is a reasonable amount of time. So plan your Series A, not that it needs to be quick money, but it needs to be the right kind of uh, relationship and stewardship to grow the company. Cause it's like a foundation. You build the foundation quickly and without the right materials, you'll end up with problems later on. You build the foundation carefully, thoughtfully, and with the right partners, then you can grow and you can actually build a very large structure on it. And that's kind of where we felt that the, the persistence in the right, getting the right founding uh, members was very important. Yeah, that's I can, I can attest to that, having had the honor and the privilege of being uh, with Najib from day one, as he was thinking through these big ideas and, and we would meet and, and go through you know, kind of the really big breakthrough ideas that would accomplish these things. And, and he was, and I've never seen an entrepreneur being that thoughtful about this topic that he just talked about. I think he passed on two or three term sheets uh, early on where people were actually giving him money. And I've never seen an entrepreneur actually not take it. <laughs> and, and because I think he always had this you know, vision of, okay, I'm going to do something big. And to do that, you not only do you need uh, people who care about the topic, like let's say the breakthroughs, the 51 billion Bill Gates trying to save the environment, to not only people who can be the end customers drivers like BMW, to not people who can actually help with the scale up of a very multi-billion dollar, you know, uh, large gigafactories and so on and so forth. So really, you know, being thoughtful about, 
what are the big chess pieces that have to be moved on the board, not in three months, six months, nine months, but sort of over the course of a, of, of a longer period as you're building something valuable. I saw him really masterfully kind of assemble that team. And, uh, you know, and I think that is what's paying off because you have like-minded people, even coming from different perspectives with different goals, but all the goals align towards one vector, which is pushing the company forward in the direction that, that Mujib wanted to, you know, to take it uh, into. So, so really, really good advice for uh, entrepreneurs that are listening, you know, be very thoughtful about who you want around, who you want in your cap table, who do you want in the boardroom that can help you, you know, think through those uh, issues. Um, now, now that we're sitting in Silicon Valley, I have to, I have to, you know, kind of get your thoughts on, on this topic. We're all used to, I grew up in the semiconductor industry, built companies, Moore's Law, uh, you know, 2x every 18 months. Uh, uh, and, you know, so in from this, you know, 80s to today, we've gotten million X in terms of number of transistors on a chip and complexity and so on and so forth. Uh, so it's been a really, really interesting 50 year journey. I wasn't part of all 50, but I've been part of almost 40. So it's been, it's been great uh, even since college, since I was designing chips in college. Um, batteries and the material science and the physics uh, that uh, revolves around batteries is very different. We, you cannot expect a 2x improvement every 18 months. If we could, we, we would just be driving around the world on a single battery. So how do you think about these multifaceted challenges of, it's not just range, it's cost, it's, it's material supply, it is safety, it is uh, you know, energy density, power density. So you're trying to balance a you know, six or seven faceted problem at the same time rather than, okay, let me just double the range, you know, or, or yeah. let me just uh, double the number of transistors on, on a semiconductor chip. So do you see that changing or do you, do you see sort of technology moving at a very different pace compared to semiconductor world? Yeah, a uh, great question. And I'm gonna uh, pull in a couple of questions that are on the panel's Q&A um, uh, as well as I answer this question, because I've been reading them. There are some fascinating questions in there. Um, you know, Moore's Law and doubling every year is a fascinating example and is often cited as why can't the battery industry figure this out? Because that would be so helpful. <laughs> um, but if I look at energy, think about oil and oil has a certain number of in, embedded jewels of, uh, of energy that are embedded in the materials and the sun gives a certain amount of energy in watts per square meter every day. And if I think about the way energy works, it's governed by different principles and different levels of um, control that you can't release more energy than you currently have available. And as I look at storing energy and storing energy in smaller places, I do think that battery technology is going to make progress and make substantial progress. But we realized that we needed to unlock the ability for those new in inventions to come to the market a little faster. And let me explain that. As, as I was CTO of A123, and I would travel and visit with a number of different tech startups, including some that have gone public recently, um, and they were just founding themselves in those days, I looked at the fact that, you know, meeting automotive requirements is the threshold that every large scale energy storage company, uh, as they're starting out, wants to achieve. They want to get to the automotive market. That's the massive market. Consumer is the other massive market. And there are different types of requirements, but both of those requirements are pretty substantial. You have to meet safety costs, you have to meet energy density, there's cycle life, a lot of requirements. What we did at one is we recognize that there is a library coming of new technologies that can accelerate energy density and cost and access to new materials. But we have to change the architecture of a battery where one segment deals with automotive, the other segment is going to be this host for advanced technologies. And as one year, two years, five years down the road, we're gonna keep getting uh, introductions to companies that have just the right technologies for the second battery that is only then governed by needing to charge the first battery slowly and persistently and without a lot of complexity. That second battery can be extraordinarily different 
and the way that it operates. And, and an example of that is you go on the periodic table from lead to nickel to lithium. We're at the top of the periodic table with lithium as a metal. And it, it is not easy to get beyond lithium because then you're at you know, helium, which doesn't do anything, and hydrogen, which we all understand is hydrogen fuel cell. So the next big thing is multi-electron. You're going to get to where you pull an ion, then you get two electrons and three electrons and four electrons. Well, then the voltage is going to be very wide. As the voltage becomes wide in that second battery, it's not drivable. You can't run a motor and an inverter with a really wide um, delta in the top and bottom of discharge. So the second battery idea, the dual battery, is one battery is automotive. The other one is like all about technology evolution and just extraordinary range. And as we do that pairing, we're going to see, I think, an acceleration at how fast the market can adopt a new technology because we have very limited requirements on cycle life and energy, uh, cycle life on uh, discharge rate, on charge rate. So we are the enabling platform, we believe. And that's where, so one of the questions was, what was one of the most frustrating things with fundraising? Well, it, no, I wouldn't say it was frustrating, but it took a long time. We had to try to prove that we had a sustainable differentiation. The question that I was taught by Fassel is like, what's your sustainable differentiation? And I think about that question a lot because actually there's so much power in that question. It's what is your idea that someone can't take away from you? And another question that was in the Q&A is why can't big companies, e.g. Tesla, et cetera, take this idea and do it? Well, we have already now um, implemented a suite of intellectual property protection around the dual battery architecture, how the second battery will come in, the chemistry of the second battery, the power management, the machine learning and AI algorithms to move energy back and forth. We have to be very careful to protect that new platform. And what I would say to you is until now, the power electronics in the world have never been smaller or cheaper and that's enabled this idea. That's another big enabling idea is as electric vehicles needed better power electronic designs with silicon carbide and other uh, advances in technology, we've taken advantage of that to create the energy management system that moves energy back and forth. And so um, a, a sustainable differentiation is a tough question to answer as an entrepreneur. What we answered is that we have a platform architecture that will grow even if the tech technology is expiring, like the chemistry is no longer the best, we're ready to adopt the next best chemistry and we can do it faster than anyone else because our requirements are lower than everyone else. And in that idea, everyone started to understand that we're not a chemistry play, which is a dangerous risk in the investment world. And that's where a lot of people have steered away from energy investment. We are not an energy investment we're a platform architecture for all of the energy developers of the world to commercialize and partner with. And that's already happening. We have a lot of people reaching out to try to do partnerships with us based on the technology and the platform. Yeah. And, and, and Majib is so right. I mean, we would meet uh, in the early days of the company very frequently and, and he would come up with one brilliant after idea after another one. And I remember the day he put this idea forward, we were like, okay, this is it. And, and I'm, I was like, can this be protected? Can you sustain it? And, and ironically enough, that he'd already written a provisional patent and applied for it within like four days. <laughs> so, so it's an area which uh, now that it's been uh, created, uh, it's so logical and makes a lot of sense. But for many, many years, people were uh, or a decade when I'm talking to some of the experts in this space, they were working on this and couldn't solve this problem, couldn't solve the hybrid architecture, the DC to DC, the entire you know management of multiple chemistries in, in one package is not something that is easy to do. And uh, one has the patents and the protection on, on that whole idea and its implementations, which is also you know very critical as an investor. Uh, we look for things that can be uh, protected that can actually uh, sustain, you know, for the next twenty years, not just not just for the next one or two years. Um, well, good. So I have so many more questions that we can get into, but it looks like there's a lot of questions online. Uh, Farhan, do you want to um, uh, do you want us to just take a look at uh, those, or do you want to allow people to ask those questions themselves? Well, what's the right format?
So, uh, Faisal, let's take take a few questions. Let's make it a little bit more interactive. Um, if you if you have joined our call today, uh, please raise your hand. I already see some hands that are raised. So I'm going to promote uh, first uh, Muhammad Yunus uh, to a co panelist, and uh, please uh, go ahead and ask your question once you have been promoted. Just give me one second. Um, so, Mohammed, you please go ahead and ask your question. Okay. Yes, we can hear you. Hello. Yeah. My question is actually you have this two sort of batteries. One is an extender, and is that extender battery is replaceable? I mean, why you carry that other battery weight all the time with you when you're not using it? Yeah. That's one of the question, and then I have follow up question on the measurements. When I get chance, I may ask that one also. Very good. When we set the goals for the battery uh, targets, we decided that let's use an example: uh, the Tesla Model S that we uh, built a battery for and did 752 miles range run. That battery um, has a certain mass, a certain volume, and liters and a certain uh, energy density, we decided to keep the mass of the battery approximately the same, but double the amount of energy in it. And when we can do that, what you did is you gave the customer access to do a much larger reserve for all the conditions of the real world. If the customer were to try to remove three to 400 kilograms or a thousand pounds of mass, they would never be able to solve that regularly. It's not like it's a small battery and you just take a door off and you pull it out, although I hope we get there one day. It's not quite like that right now. And so we don't see that as something that the customer would replace or not, uh, they wouldn't manage that. But to give you an idea of why there's another benefit is when you make the battery much larger, then what happens is you, you push the battery less in discharge, they call it C-rate, the percentage of power to energy. And as you're moving energy and power and you make the reservoir very large, then you don't go very deep. What well, turns out the stress on a battery is related to how deep you go in the, in the depth of discharge. And you can preserve lifetime, you can improve thermal management, your power, your current, all of those things get a lot easier for the battery. Therefore, the battery becomes less complex. So I've been able to remove a lot of complexity from our battery technology. In fact, in, if I benchmark, leading OEMs, and I can say five of them have an average of 44% of their battery is cell, the cell you know, volume. We are at 76% of our battery is cell. We've been able to strip out of the battery a whole bunch of complexity that was like dead weight. And if we do that effectively, we're driving cost down, we're driving the energy density up. We're moving in the direction where it's almost all about the cell and the reason we can do this is we put so much energy on board that we're stressing that battery a lot less. And so there is a bit of architectural benefit in keeping the battery size very high. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Majeev, for that. I think uh, Farhan, you want to move to the next question? Okay. Well, thank you for your answer. Other very quick question is, the battery is not one huge cell, it's a multiple cell. And the weakest cells, you're probably the limiting factor. So how you measure that and how you determine that and what you do to make sure that you can root out and you can have ability to predict the life of the battery? Yeah, very good question. You know, when I named the company One uh, for our next energy, I had to pick an extension and we use the extension .ai. While batteries today don't use machine learning and AI algorithms, very often, nor do they need to, we're going to heavily need to do that. We're going to cloud compute and we're going to help decide the best course of action to, to maintain health, safety, range, all of the other topics. So we are very committed to developing the algorithms and the platform for energy management alongside the chemistries and the battery systems. Yeah. Without disclosing too many technical details, I've seen the, the 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 pack designs and the module designs. There's a tremendous amount of 
uh, let's say AI and state of health of every cell that Majib is monitoring very carefully and storing. So it's a lot more than just chemistry play here. Uh, we'll get into that inshallah in some future date. Sure. All right. So I've promoted Iftikhar. Um, please go ahead and ask her question. Iftikhar Ahmed. Iftikhar, you're on mute. Assalamu alaikum. This is Iftikhar and Sadia. Uh, thank you for this wonderful uh, conversation, Faisal and Majib. So I have two questions. Uh, one um, uh, for Majib. Um, so one of a uh, one of the big concerns with Tesla batteries and other EV batteries is their disposition. Uh, the impact on the environment when these batteries run their course and how they will impact the environment. Could you talk about um, anything different with your battery? And then the second question I have is that um, the price of oil where it is right now, um, it was last seen here in, I think, 2008. And that was a watershed moment for alternative energy where um, you know, people kind of realize that we can't live like this. Uh, but there is a very strong other side uh, rearing its head also, which is saying that we need to drill more. So this is a question for both uh, Mujib and Faisal. What do you see the, the, basically the future of alternative energy? Thank you. It, yeah. So uh, from the standpoint of recycling and end of life, we're looking at strategies for uh, recovering of the materials, but to explain the end of life a little bit, I'm gonna give you three battery examples. There's a lead acid battery market, there's a lithium cobalt um, technology and all the consumer electronic cells like iPhone and Galaxy Note 7, et cetera. And then there are the batteries that we're developing for future of electric vehicles with lithium iron phosphate and other chemistries. In the case of lead acid, lead was so clearly an advantage to bring back that every, everyone pays you a core deposit before you buy a new one. So that encourages the retrieval of the battery. That's the most important thing in end of life is how do you encourage the retrieval of the battery itself? And in that context, the lead is cheaper in the recycled lead than it is in mining new lead. That's the virtuous cycle that you want. In cobalt, same thing's happening as iPhones and other products that are using these types of cobalt, 100% cobalt cells, the recycling is positive. They'll pay you for the battery. Therefore, there's a motivation to get it. And unfortunately, in electric vehicle batteries, the extraction of lithium and other materials is a cost negative. And it's on the order of $1,000 per battery system in an electric vehicle that you have to pay to have the materials extracted. And it's because you have a massive amount of chemical processes, thermal processes, you're generating CO2, you're generating chemical waste. There's a lot of like not easy to do. So what we're working on right now is there's some ideas around the utilization of the battery in a second life, a third life, where you actually string out the utilization to maybe 30 years and that you're not talking about a 10 year life in automotive only, but you're working to go second, third. And then the raw material extraction is not that you're trying to earn money on it, but you're simply trying to return and close the loop. And now I've seen new companies that are bu uh, bu building businesses in the US on recycling of these materials to make it at least not cost negative. To get to cost neutrality on cycling, recycling will be then enough to where we can bring the materials back into the supply chain. Uh, but the other answer is to utilize the value because the automotive definition of end of life is 80% of the battery is remaining but actually in the grid and other services, you can use that 80% for a lot of purposes, including firming the grid, home storage, there are a lot of purposes that you could get out of a battery technology that has that kind of capability. Um, on the second question, I'll turn it over to Fassel to begin with, and I'll give you my thoughts, but please yeah. go ahead. So um, Sadia, great question in terms of price of oil. And, and so the way I look at it, you know, from my investment thesis perspective, I look at two things. There is the cost to the environment. So what is the real cost of a technology? And then it is what we call sort of the green premium, uh, which is electric vehicles, you're getting 10, 12, 15,000 from the government. That was a green premium for you to buy the same car, you would buy a gas car otherwise. So the government's had the same thing with solar subsidies. Those are all things that what I consider green premiums that the governments or somebody has to pay you to adopt a technology 
uh, otherwise it's, it's not cost effective and unless you are one of those very small percentage of people that are willing to pay more for the green premium to save the environment. So the thesis that that I have taken, you know, firstly from my investment perspective is I'm interested, you know, humanity at the end of the day will be driven by uh, cost effective solutions. So the price of oil going up on one side and innovation and technology to the, the lower the cost of these technologies where there is no green premium, where you are costing your, as Majib said, solar is at par with you know, building up a next, next gas plant. We should not be building any more coal plants if you can en generate energy from solar and ultimately hydrogen and so on and so forth uh, at a cost effective way. So I'm seeing those two things coming together in a really, really good way where I don't think uh, we turn back uh, this time. I think we continue the investment forward and we eliminate uh, with use of technology, the green premiums on these things. And, uh, uh, and, and I think the hydrocarbons will have their place. I, I'm not saying we'll eliminate them altogether, but we have to reduce the use of hydrocarbons and we have to increase how those hydrocarbons will be sequestered and how do we make sure that they don't emit the greenhouse gases that they do today. So there, there's, a, there's a whole host of technologies and, and global you know, geopolitical things that are at play here, but I think they're working in, in the favor of going in the right direction. Uh, I'll add one thing to that, and I completely agree with that. The, uh, the idea of uh, making the transition, I study a bunch of the early 1900, between 1890 and 1900, there were a lot of mobility ideas that were just kind of starting out. There was the horseless carriage with an engine that would use oil and gasoline equivalent petroleum products, but also there were steam powered, but interestingly, there were a lot of electric power. In 1900, if you measured the number of mobility products in the road, uh, and especially in the Detroit area, it was more electric than any of the other two. And it ebbed and flowed between electric, steam, and gasoline because they had different problems, different attributes. Steam engines took, steam cars took two hours to warm up. Um, gasoline cars were hard to start. You had to crank a lever and sometimes people would even break their wrist and getting them to run. And electric cars were actually promoted as being pretty phenomenal because they had, uh, you could charge it, you could charge it if you had electricity at home, you could charge it home. You didn't have to worry about finding oil because it or petroleum products because they weren't available. And you could kind of um, start them in even the cold weather conditions. But it wasn't until the merger of three ideas that the petroleum and automotive market just selected gasoline. It was the merger of the right cost structure, the right set of attributes in the product, and then the right infrastructure. And the right cost structure, we're getting there. Electric cars have moved out of the 100,000 down to, I think we're gonna to get to the 35, 40,000, and that's gonna be the new norm anyway for automotive purchases. There, I think the extension of like the financing for electric cars is gonna to go to 10 years, not stay at five and seven years. That'll also make the cost structure easier for people to adopt because the product durability is so much better. We're talking half a million miles, not an unreasonable goal for electric cars in the long-term future, more like an appliance, less like a engine. And that's where I think we're headed. The second thing is the product attributes, getting the range right, getting it to where the product meets your needs is what we're working on. Because I think the cost structure will come down, getting that range number to where people are like, absolutely, I'm convinced I can get an electric car as my only vehicle. And not only is it uh, a good car, it's better than every car I've ever had in all attributes. That's the goal. It's not that they have to then give up something or compromise. And then the third is infrastructure. The infrastructure itself is evolving, but as you make the range enough, then the infrastructure becomes more about wherever you are naturally, your, your home, your work, and where you want to shop. Those are your natural infrastructures, not a gas station that you try to like, you know, spend 15 minutes out of your way and charge up. It's more like wherever you are, you have access. And if you sit on an airplane, there's a USB port for your iPhone or your, your mobile phone. If you sit almost anywhere on a train, there's always a way to charge your phone. And that's actually the kind of future that we're likely to see in electric vehicle. The merger of those three things happened in the 1920s for automotive. They invented the electric starter. The battery that was designed by Edison for electric cars turned into the electric starter battery 
which then solved the major problem there. And then the petroleum industry took off because cars were cheaper and people just wanted that product. And that that's how the three came together a century ago. I see those three things coming together now for electric vehicles over the next decade or two. Great, wonderful, good. Uh, do we have time for one more question or we're over time now, Farhan? We can take one more question for sure. Okay, so. Um, you Imran, pick. Imran Kedwai, I think you're next. I'm gonna promote you to panelist. Um, Imran, please go ahead. Imran, you're on mute right now. There we go. You can hear me now? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Good. So uh, maybe it's been touched upon already, but um, uh, with the current global events, as well as the recent IPCC report uh, on the part of many, there is a strong desire to speed up the reduction of our dependence on fossils and to move quickly to zero emissions. The question is, and this is a question we used to get asked in large companies, uh, unlimited resources maybe, so can one move any faster towards widespread commercial deployment if more investment or other resources were available to you? Yeah, uh, we have already accelerated our timelines for building a US self factory. Um, our board has approved the um, investigation. It's a study at this point because we have a lot of work to do to prove that we can um, actually legitimately get the funding and the site planning and the partnerships necessary for building um, US supply chain together. Uh, but we, we are accelerating and in our investment cycle, I think what we're seeing in the energy space is the investment cycle is being compressed at a two to three to one, meaning that going from series A to B to C, um, the level of progress that we need to make is um, actually we are, we are behind by about a decade. If I have to be honest with you, especially the Western world and the US market, we're e easily behind one decade. To catch up a decade in a decade is tough, but that's kind of the nature of the assignment that we have to do right now is we have to go twice as fast as anyone else has ever done before to just get to on par with where Asia has developed. China has had, they have over 400,000 electric buses running around in China. We have less than a thousand. I mean, it's it's in the U.S. It's not developed in other parts of the world where solar and battery and and uh, the in investment in electric vehicle is emerging right now. The development of factories, the development of raw material supply chains, that's also now competing for the same global resources, and therefore you get into supply chain development. Supply chain development is the big topic right now, but I do think um, more investment and faster investment does help us commercialize and speed up. And that's what, you know, one is really focused on it right now is creating industrial scale. So our ideas are not just in the lab, but we can move them into products. Yeah, and, and Imran, uh, as, and, you know, obviously supply chain and manufacturing scale up is really critical. Uh, but in terms of, you know, the widespread adoption that you're asking about, um, Mujib and his team is also working on some really exciting solutions for additional markets other than just EVs. So we will leave it at that. But suffice to say, we're, we're you know, they're not just stopping at uh, EVs. So um, many, many other adjacent markets that are absolutely open and, uh, you know, and the widespread adoption is important for all of those because ultimately, you know, it's all about at any time you use any other fossil energy, you are contributing to the carbon footprint. So uh, whether it is, um, you know, marine applications or <clears throat> other industrial applications or residential applications, there, there is a lot of use of this technology in many, many other markets. So we'll, we'll continue to get as widespread as we can. <laughs> All right, good. Um, Farhan, so we call it uh, a day. And I wanted to just, from my perspective, thank Majeev for taking time out on Saturday uh, to do this thing. And uh, hopefully this was useful. And, and if there are follow-ups, uh, I'm sure Farhan can um, get some more questions and more you know, burning concerns that folks have on the phone. We'll, we'll try to get those answered as well. Absolutely. Um, thank you so much, Faisal for um, 
for doing this Gup Shop session today. And thank you so much, Mujib. We can go on and on. This has been um, brilliant. Um, and it's been a pleasure knowing Faisal, both you and, and Mujib. Um, as I mentioned, when I, when I heard uh, that Faisal, you'll be doing this Gup Shop with Mujib, I started looking more into Mujib's role and his career. And it's, it's extremely impressive. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and quite honestly, every time I sit in my car and I drive Long Ridge, Mujib, I'll be thinking about you. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good brand development. You know, think one. When you have a range problem, think one and we'll get, we'll get there one day. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, yeah. and, and I'll end uh, one on a very um, uh, small personal note. Uh, Mujib and I have known each other our whole lives, not just professionally, but we're also cousins. We're also first cousins. And by sheer of some amazing set of coincidences, his parents teaching professors in Saudi Arabia, we both ended up in a same boarding school in Virginia for a short period of time. So, but this has been so much uh, fun to actually build something to change the world now together. So, so best of luck. <laughs> Absolutely. And we'll, we'll look forward to having Faisal Yu and Mujib back at one of, one of our annual forums. And hopefully we can do that in person so people get a chance to meet you, sit down with you, get your advice and get to know a little bit more of your thoughts on how you're thinking about the future. So with that, thank you very much everyone for joining. A recording of this will be available on our YouTube channel as well. Um, and as Faisal mentioned, if you have any follow-up questions, please feel free to reach out to Faisal. Faisal is also a charter member of Open Silicon Valley. We're very grateful for the time that he has dedicated today. And so is, we are grateful to Mujib as well. So thank you so much, uh, gentlemen. And we'll look forward to uh, wishing, first of all, wishing you all the best, Mujib. Thank you. Me ahead. And uh, Faisal, we'll look forward to hearing more from you. All right. Take care. Take care. Salam. Bye. Bye. Bye.